okay, just just a few words. The presentation will be in English. So if you have some problem with it, I suggest you either come see us afterwards so we can explain some things in Bulgarian. The Q&A section, if we have time for it, will be held both in Bulgarian and in English, so I hope there will be no problem with that. And uh, let's start. We'll start with the words of a wise, very wise and very smart man who could not be very, who could not be so, so wrong in the year 2008. I, I hope you can read this for yourself. It says, the, inter the interesting thing about cloud computing is that we've redefined cloud computing to include everything that we already do. I can't think of anything that isn't cloud computing with all of these announcements. The computer industry is the only industry that is more fashion driven than women's fashion. Maybe I'm an idiot, but I have no idea what anyone is talking about. What is it? It's complete gibberish. It's insane. When is this idiocy going to stop? Does anybody know who said that? These were the words of Larry Ellison, the CEO of Oracle. <laughs> so let's start with who we are. Uh, this is my good friend and colleague, Vanellin. He is a programmer, and uh, he has this no bullshit approach to programming. At the same time, he is also a, a very, a very avid Apple fan. You can sit down. <laughs> <laughs> He is fluent in Java, Objective-C, PHP, and C++, and we, we use those languages in our everyday work. Uh, he worked for several Bulgarian IT companies, and uh, he also did some work in the uh, Leuven University where he worked on the next generation of uh, digital signatures. And the other guy on the board is me. Uh, I'm a Linux Everywhere advocate. I started in 1997 with my first Linux distribution. It was Red Hat. And uh, I installed it, saw the virtual X display, the size of it, and I instantly fell in love with it. Then I worked in several places. And about two years ago, we we were actually high school uh, buddies with him. From how long do we know each other? 12, 13 years? Anyway, so we met two years ago and decided to join forces and to start this startup company. Evil Puppy, we called it. It's a tech startup that deals with cloud computing and at the same time, we also do stuff in the embedded sector. We do a lot of handset programming. We also do a lot of automotive programming, a set of box programming. We use different technologies. So that's about it about us. Um, let's get on topic though. This is the topic of today's lecture, using open source technologies to create enterprise level cloud systems, optimize your costs, and offset your carbon footprint on the environment. But let's get controversial first. There are two things that you need to know. Our planet is changing. The climate is changing. Essentially, what hap what's happening is that at some places, temperatures rise, and at some places, temperatures fall. And we, the people living on this planet, are one of the factors for that. But at some point, this debate about climate change got political. There is this battle of left and right. People on the, on the left side like us, because either way, we are all here kind of socialists, even communists. We believe in open source. We share our work, we contribute, and we don't mind peop if people use it to make money out of it, just as long as they contribute back, back something to, to our community. So I think that this idea that we should work, all, all of us should work to offset this climate change um, will kind of resonate very well with, with you people here. So there is this idea that if uh, something is leftist, socialist, it's fiscally irresponsible. That if, if you spend a lot of money, this, this can be good for your business. Well, it's probably right, but not everywhere. We have this situation right, right now where you can 
invest and at the same time cut your costs. Basically, if you invest in your infrastructure, buy new, better servers and build clouds with them, you can offset, first of all, a lot of carbon, carbon emissions, essentially by cutting your electrical bills. So, essentially what, what we are trying to say is consolidate your infrastructure, but do it smartly. Don't do it the way that most people did it before. Don't just buy new and better servers. Buy new and better servers and use them to build your own clouds where you'll distribute your load and essentially build better life. So what is a cloud? Does anybody know here what is a cloud? Nobody? <laughs> really? <laughs> no, just just a random one, yeah. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. No, not a precise, just a basic idea of what cloud is. <laughs> Give one. A virtualized infrastructure where you can get uh, computing power and storage and processing and processing and computing and everything. That's a service thing. Yeah, it's a service. Yeah. That's a service. Well, that's the definition that Oracle uses. That's the definition that Amazon uses. And that's the definition we're going to use today here. We don't believe in the cloud in the way that, um, let's say, Salesforce believes in the cloud. We don't believe web applications are clouds. Software as a service is a very good idea, but it's not exactly a cloud. It actually existed before the, the term cloud existed. So in that, in that aspect, Larry Ellison was right. <laughs> Essentially, what we're going to talk today about is the private cloud and how these private clouds can actually bring costs down in your company. Um, but let's first step back a bit. There, is, there are public, public clouds and private clouds. Public clouds are the ones like Amazon's or Rackspace or even Oracle and HP. They all, all they offer um, public cloud infrastructures where you can go and buy a virtual instance and use it, what, whatever you like. So essentially, you can install st standard software on it, a Linux operating system, a BSD operating system, Windows operating system, whatever you, you like to use. And uh, in this way, you can, you can essentially move all your server needs in the public space. You pay as much as you use, that's it. But there is um, a bit of a problem with uh, those public, public cloud infrastructures. And uh, the people can, that can tell you more about it are essentially Foursquare or Reddit or uh, all, all the other services that died during uh, the outage of the Amazon Elastic Cloud about a month ago. So there is this, this uh, constant battle. Should we invest in new servers or uh, should we buy a virtual service from someone, somebody else? Well, the investment is needed, essentially. You need to buy new servers and you need to build your own private cloud where you're independent from everybody else. Also, in the private cloud sector, you can choose what power, mm, what power you, you'll use. You can use renewables like solar or um, wind. You can, you can essentially choose to buy power from uh, a nuclear plant or you can still use coal and oil for, for your energy needs. With the public cloud, you don't know what to use. There are some data about um, what the public clouds are using, but essentially you don't know what it is. These are some numbers, the, two, the, the 2007 number. This is about 
all, it's actually about all cloud computing, not only public. These are 632 billion kilowatt hours are used in the 2007 in the whole cloud business. In the 2020, the, the number will rise, rise to uh, about 2,000 billion kilowatt hours. And this equal, the, the number that the emissions will see is about 1,000 megaton. This is the equivalent that 203 or four, 204 million cars produce in a year. That's our consumption of the cloud. That will be in, in the year to, to 2020. About 200, 200 million cars. Of course, this is uh, based on a study of Greenpeace, so take it with a grain of salt. So this is about I show you the raw numbers, but this is the number that in 2011 will be essentially saved. This is 6.7 million ton CO2. And in 2014, the projected number will be 25 million ton CO2. This is how much we'll save by using cloud. This is a number that's compared to a bare metal IT infrastructure where, where you all your servers the way you, you used to use them right now, where you have an operating system and install your applications to top of it. Again, some numbers. This is a model derived percentage, percentage of CO2 savings. The number in 2011 is 9%. In 2014, 25%. And by the year 2020, even though cloud computing will use about the amount of, uh, will produce the amount of CO2 that's equivalent to 200 uh, million cars, we'll still cut 50%. Unfortunately, you can't see the graphic here very well, but uh, this is actually the cloud and the number The number is 170 here, unfortunately. Yeah, you can see. This is compared cloud with no cloud. No cloud infrastructure where you use bare metal, cloud infrastructure where you use basically your metal like, like a hardware accelerated cloud storage. So enough about politics. Let's get back to business and to open source. How and why you should build your own cloud system? We propose a, a method that we used a lot, and it works, and it works very well. The tool that we use is called Libbird. I don't know if somebody heard it here. Have you heard about it? Yeah, there are people who have heard about it. <laughs> okay, so essentially, Libbird is this. Um, virtualization agnostic, uh, agnostic API. What it gives you is the ability to have a common interface to all those types of hi hypervisors out there. You can use Zen, you can use KVM, you can use VMware, you can use uh, VirtualBox if you like, whatever you like. So not only hypervisors, it supports c containers, technologies like OpenVZ, or LXC, or mm, Linux vServer. They're all supported by Libbird. Libbird gives this ability um, to abstract your setup in a way that you can essentially build very complex network solutions. Libbird uses the idea of a virtualized network switch. Basically, if you have a hardware platform, a server, where you host a lot of virtual machines, they're all connected to the host machine through this virtual switch. So you can do a lot of very complex network stuff. You can basically do um, bridging or NAT or even mm, isolated machines inside this network container. 
Libert also does the storage, uh, the storage abstraction of uh, cloud computing, let's say. You have this support for fiber channels, for iSCSI, which is basically very well supported, and it works straight out of the box. It also supports InfiniBump. It's actually InfiniBump is our favorite right now because it's very fast and very straightforward to set up. Um, it also does all your virtual instances management. You can essentially move your virtual, virtual machines between hardware hosts. Let's say you have a hardware host, a server, and you put libvirt on it. You have another hardware server where you put another libvirt instance on it. So what you can do is essentially start up a lot of virtual instances on those machines, and you can move them around depending on your load. Or if you like, you can do a load balancing between them. And at any, at any given point, you can distribute this between data centers. We have done this, and it works very well. Basically, we had a couple of data centers into different cities. And what we did, we essentially built all our host operating system were Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So we installed Libvirt on it, on every instance, on every hardware instance, and essentially built on top of it a lot of virtual servers. At any given point, when we have problems in one data center, we just migrated our virtual machines to the other data center. So this is very similar to what Amazon does, but essentially you do it. You in, in the Amazon cloud, you're not really sure where your instance is running at any given point. This way, you know. And this way, you move it where you need it. So, libvirt is essentially the tool that manages the cloud. But we need a hypervisor. And our hypervisor is KVM. We chose KVM, the kernel virtual machine. It's completely open source. It's part of the Linux kernel. And uh, it supports AMD V and Intel VT technologies. These are the virtualization technologies of Intel and AMD. KVM is also industry backed, um, along with Red Hat, who are essentially the owner of the company that first written the KVM. There, there is also support from IBM, HP, Canonical, Novel and a lot of other companies. There is this open source cloud alliance that includes all those companies. So um, KVM not only supports the virtualization um, instruction sets of the AMD and Intel, it also supports the extended virtualization technologies in those processors. You have the ability to use um, um, Direct, uh, direct access to PCI, also this thing called PCI Express. And uh, just to show you how, how good this is, actually, I can, on top of my head, think about three scenarios about this. One scenario is, let's say that um, you're, let's say you're running some kind of a hardware security model, HSM. I don't know if anyone knows here what HSMs is, are, actually. HSMs, HSMs are basically the stuff that uh, drives uh, digital signatures in Bulgaria. These are hardware security models. So you can put a hardware security model in a hardware server where you can give access to this hardware security model to, to a single virtual instance. Essentially what you can do is create a digital signature company in Bulgaria with just few servers, like three servers. That's, that's just about enough. Another, another very good example is if you do GPGPU, essentially you can, you can buy Tesla or Fermi hardware from NVIDIA, and you can put a lot of those in your hardware server, and you can create virtual instances where you can assign a certain video processing uh, uh, hardware to a, to a certain virtual instance. This way you can essentially build a high computing platform on the chip. Mm. What KVM does is essentially it's a very thin client hypervisor. Unlike VMware, 
where you go and buy a VMware product where you install it on every single server instance. Actually, I don't know if you're aware, but VMware is basically, uh, basically uh, built on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 4.0. So they have their hypervisor running on modified version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Well, this is not the case. You can essentially choose whatever you like with KVM. You can choose Ubuntu, you can choose, uh, choose Debian, you can choose Fedora, you can even choose Arch Linux. We actually use Arch Linux at some places to use KVM on top of it. It's essentially a part of the kernel. It's not a patch. It's not something you do download and enable. It's part of the vanilla kernel. You download it, you compile it, you have it. So it allows you on a 64-bit Intel instruction set um, machine to run unmodified 32-bit and 64-bit operating system systems. The guess could be Linux, Windows, all the BSDs, even Solaris. You can run those operating systems with no modification inside, inside this hypervisor. You can also run QNX and some fringe operating systems like Android. <laughs> also, what KVM includes is this far virtualized block device, a network device. So what it does, I don't know if you're aware, but KVM uses actually QMU to manage all the all the operating systems. So QMU usually um, basically emulates hardware, like the network hardware and the block devices. You have this emulated CSI adapter, so emulated um, uh, uh, parallel auto adapters, but um, as they're emulated, they're not very fast. What you have is actually this virtualized block device, para virtualized block device, which is extremely fast. And it's very, very useful if you like to build, let's say, a very complex structure. And you probably would like to build that because that's the way clouds are built. You have this very, very complex infrastructure where you have, uh, let's say, a SAM, a storage area network, that you've connected with all the fiber channel uh, cards and uh, fiber channel switches to your servers. So what you do is basically basically have a lot of paths to one single device. That's multipathing. I don't know if, if you have ever used multipathing in a Linux operating system, but essentially what, what it gives you is full redundancy and better performance. So through this power virtualized block device, you can use multipathing in the Linux operating system. You have this um, um, infrastructure on the host where you basically run the multipathing and you can access all those enumerated devices on the Linux host through those para virtualized block devices. It's the same with the network device. Instead of using um, emulated network card, card you basically use um, para virtualized network device. What it gives you is the speed of, let's say, the host operating system, about 98% of the speed of the host operating system, which theoretically should be equal to the bare metal speed of the hardware. It's not the case, but anyway, theoretically, it should give you about so 98% of the bare metal speed. In other words, if you have a 10 gigabit Ethernet interface, you can essentially use that in a virtual machine with all the speed that it, it provides. So this power virtualized block devices, network devices, have drivers for Windows and they work very well indeed. For Linux, for FreeBSD 9, NetBSD also uses them. And uh, this year in the Google, Google Summer of Code, somebody ported the NetBSD drivers to run by BSD. Um, what KVM also provides is the ability to very aggressively use system resources. Essentially, what you have is this uh, ability to overcommit memory and CPUs. Overcommitting basically means that if you have a fixed number of CPUs on a hardware server and a fixed, uh, and a fixed amount of memory, you can essentially put so much virtual machines on top of it that they can exceed the physical amount of memory and CPUs. So you can achieve a very high density 
In other words, if you've used the cloud till now, you can essentially use your hardware better by using KVM and Libgrid on top of it. Actually, at a certain at a certain project we worked, we achieved about 250% higher density with KVM compared to VMware. Um, we used this ability in the kernel. It's called kernel same page margins, and it's essentially enabled in kernels above 2.6.38, which allows memory on uh, different virtual machines. Let's say, cap let's say you have a um, two or three virtual machines running MySQL or PostgreSQL or whatever, whatever else, let's say Apache, it doesn't really matter. You have these virtual machines that run the same software. And um, what the kernel same page merging does is essentially you have divided every virtual machine of um, four gigabytes memory. The kernel same page merging allows all the same pages in those virtual machines to be merged in the host operating system's memory. So in other words, if you overcommit, let's say you have a eight gigabytes memory on the hardware host, and you build four virtual machines totaling 16 gigabytes memory, and you use the KSM, essentially you can achieve about six gigabyte memory usage of all those virtual machines, although they see each four gigabyte, and you still, you, you still have about two gigabytes on the host. So, in this project that we did, we actually dropped a full blade enclosure of PowerEdge servers, Dell PowerEdge servers, that um, this, is, this is just the number of, uh, of, the of the power that we cut because of the blade enclosure, but we also turned off one of the air conditioning systems. So between eight and 10 kilowatts we cut only by using KVM and Libvirt. We also, because of the higher density we achieved, we cut the power consumption of one of our uh, C7000 systems. That's, that's an HP blade system. That's current generation. The power edge uh, systems are not current generation. They are previous generation Intel servers. Okay, so let's say you have those servers back from the 2005 that don't support hardware virtualization. What you could do is go out and buy new servers. And as we've shown you, it's a very good technique to save um, money, essentially. You buy new servers, they're very efficient, they're very capable, and you can um, essentially save money. Your bottom line will grow. But there is, there is this technique also out there that uh, you can use to essentially still use your old servers. Because for certain types of um, laws, actually for most, for most laws, the old servers are still very, very good. You can use uh, mail servers or um, web servers or whatever on those servers, and they're still good. But um, you have two ways to do that. You can essentially, you can essentially, mm, um, use them as a bare metal hardware. Where you install the operating system, install application, and use it. Or you can do something like OS level virtualization. This is not the exact term, and it's not really the correct term. The, the better term is the one that uh, Solaris uses. It's essentially slicing or containers inside the operating system, where you run an unmodified operating system but the same operating system on top of, on top of uh, the one that you're running. Essentially what you do is you have a Linux or Solaris in other, in other cases. You have a Linux where you run a lot of Linux operating systems inside it. It's like truth on jails, uh, truth on steroids. It's, uh, you're all, all aware about truthing. So you, you install an operating system. You have, let's say, let's say again, you have an Arch Linux. And you want to basically we are running actually uh, an instance right now of a lot of Opteron servers, old servers, about 2005, where uh, we have about four, four, eight, eight CPUs, eight CPUs with 16 gigabytes of memory on them. And uh, we have this mm, 
problem. Should we run a lot of those servers and install only one uh, application on top of it? Where, or, or even try to install more where we have those uh, input-output uh, problems and uh, essentially um, this, let's say, problems. <laughs> So what we chose actually is to use LXC. This is the Linux containers. LXC, there is driver for libvirt for LXC. Essentially what you can do is use libvirt to manage LXC2 where you can create these heterogeneous um, structures where you have OS level virtualization and hardware virtualization and you can manage them from only one place. So. Linux containers are very fast. There is almost no overhead. The penalty of running, of running LXC is about between one and three percent. So essentially, what you can do is slice the operating system and uh, install, let's say on an Arch Linux, as we did, you can install a Fedora, an Ubuntu, uh, Debian, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and you can run all those inside containers. The only problem with that is that the kernel they run is the kernel of the host operating system. So essentially, at some point, there might be problems where you're running, uh, let's say, uh, Ubuntu stable or Debian stable, and uh, you have this kernel that's very curved, the 3.0 kernel. And sometimes, because of AVI breakage, this operating system can't really work well with this new newer kernel. So you should be very conservative when picking a kernel, a host operating system, and uh, at the same time, basically you should be not that conservative running the guest operating systems because of the uh, ability to essentially have a, a backport, backport support of the ADI. So every container has its own network space. This is essentially a virtual network in, uh, network interface very similar to, to the hypervisor. What, what you can get is essentially the host operating system running on one IP and every other in the, uh, every other container is running on a totally different IP with a totally different um, um, virtual to the host operating system and very real to the guest operating system network driver. So essentially you can have a different also, also firewall uh, uh, rules for every container um, and also every container has its process space. Essentially, essentially what, what you get is basically you log in to this guest operating system, you type top and all you see are the processes that are running inside this container. On the other hand, if you log into the host operating system and you type top, you'll see all the processes of all containers. This is essentially a technique where you isolate uh, process space and it's built on top of C groups. This is control groups. This is a technique that's available in the kernel um, since 2.620. So essentially it's very mature and at the same time it's uh, supported in the vanilla kernel. So you have it almost everywhere. Almost every modern operating system supports that. Again, uh, LXC doesn't, doesn't require any specific hardware instructions. So you can essentially run it on all types of CPUs. We, we actually run Telexy containers on our um, ARM embedded systems. And if by any chance you have this ARM or MIPS servers, that kind of fringe, uh, fringe technologies, you can essentially do virtualization on top of them. The current ARM CPUs, the latest one, uh, actually is the one that only supports hardware virtualization, but the older ones, like Cortex A8 and A9, and even A15, they don't support hardware virtualization, but they're powerful enough to run all types of web applications and even mail applications, even database applications. They have a very low power footprint. Essentially an ARM, an ARM board, an ARM server uses um, about the amount of memory that your CD-ROM uses. So in other words, you can build a lot of those servers, build up a smart grid essentially, where you can do this and essentially build a form of cloud where you can unfortunately run only Linux operating systems. So these are the cons of LXC. 
LEC doesn't right now support live migration. In the way, in the way that uh, I was just given a sign that we're <laughs> running out of time. Okay, so LEC doesn't support doesn't support um, hardware migration. In other words, you don't achieve this flexibility that you you can achieve with um, uh, KVM. As I already said, it doesn't support other operating systems. It's though truly open source. It's not uh, uh, along the lines of, let's say, OpenVZ, which is not exactly open source. It, the core is open source, but that's about it. Some of the, some of the containers, uh, containers are not. Uh, there is also no apparent team that they support. Nobody is backing it. There are a couple of people from Canonical that work on it, but uh, unfortunately, no big company is pushing it as technology. So you are essentially on your own. Okay, we have about 10 more minutes. Um, we'll just go very fast to, to those slides. So, what's next? The next big thing in, in virtualization is the virtualized desktop, where you can use this technology, again developed by Kumarnet, the guys that developed KVM, and it's now owned by Red Hat, and it's open source, and it's supported. Um, this is a technology called Spice, and I suppose everyone knows here what VNC is. Well, Spice is something like that, but uh, it doesn't work at all like that. It provides 2D hardware acceler acceleration, and uh, what you can do is essentially virtualize your desktops, open source desktops uh, or proprietary desktops, like Microsoft desktops. Unfortunately, uh, right now you can't virtualize <laughs> Mac OS desktops. <laughs> What, what you get essentially is this. Let's say two or three years uh, in your company, you have to upgrade your desktops and workstations. What you can do is run all your desktops in the cloud. What you will get is essentially this ability to have a thin, very thin client, a terminal, where let's say your developers, your management, uh, your um, accountants use to access their desktops that are running in the cloud. So instead of upgrading every two or three years, what you can do is just slice a bigger piece of the pie of the cloud. You have a four, gig four gigabyte memory usage on your desktop, and somebody comes and, and says, well, that's not enough. You can just create a new virtual machine with more memory. No need of upgrade. All this is running inside the cloud. You can also use KSM, this technology we talked about, where you can essentially merge same page memory uh, mappings. So you get virtualized des desktops on the chip. Also, there is this notion that we are here to talk only about clouds and how they cut your spending and how they help help you um, achieve basically cleaner expenditure, but also what clouds provide is that they shorten your development and deployment cycle. There is a, a very good quote here from a guy from Citigroup, of course, uh, who says, carbon reduction is one driver, but not the primary driver. The primary driver is time to market. Developers used to take 45 days to get new servers, but in our virtualized private cloud environment, it takes just a couple of minutes. Well, I kind of disagree about the couple of minute thing, because we also use this thing, and uh, it takes about a couple of hours, but it's still better than uh, the two or three days that it took us to set up a development and deployment server. Actually, I'll give the floor to my colleague Vensky, who will just share his experience about this. Uh, so, in our everyday work, we develop mobile applications based, uh, mostly for all types of mobile devices, including Android and uh, iOS devices. And lately, we have started using, uh, started developing Qt applications. And sometimes we also do web apps. And for that purpose, we need uh, quite quite a few of 
testing and development environment to to do our work, and it used to take several days for uh, him to set up uh, for Ilian to set up uh, one such environment, and then um, we started using uh, we started using LXC basically on our older servers, and uh, he created for us just uh, templates that we could start and uh, use for to get our work done and uh, then we could just uh, release the hardware that we have used and continue and uh, then it's available for someone else to to, to use it and uh, with this we could uh, besides having uh, besides testing and running our web applications in uh, different conditions we could also run Migo to, to test our Qt apps and uh, we could also run the x86 version of Android uh, which allowed us to basically simulate uh, quite different devices and test our applications on them without actually having the hardware to, to run it and then just finalize the application on, on actual hand, handsets. So it really increased our productivity quite a bit. And yeah, back to him. So there is uh, this approach called scale out, where you have a private cloud, but it's just not enough. And you don't want to invest in more infrastructure. What you can do is cross over to the public cloud. Or there is another approach. You have a lot of machines in your private cloud and you would like to offer them as a uh, infrastructure as a service, the way Amazon and Rackspace does it. So there are a few projects out there that uh, do this work. One of them is OpenStack. It's developed by NASA and Rackspace. And it has support uh, from Canonical, Dell, HP, uh, AMD, Cisco. Actually, 130 companies support this thing. Unfortunately, uh, OpenStack is kind of new and very immature. Mm. As I mentioned, it gives the ability to turn your private cloud into public cloud. It's completely open source. Unlike Eucalyptus, of which you probably have heard, Eucalyptus has an open core, but uh, the product is closed source. You have to buy it before you use it. It's not the way with OpenStack. It has also a modular design where you basically you can use uh, a component that you need. You don't have to use the whole, the whole thing. There is also another, another project we, uh, which is kind of more interesting. It's called Open Nebula. It's again completely open source. And uh, it doesn't have that much of an industry support, but he, it has a lot of prominent users. KPMG, CERN, China Mobile, Telefonica, all use this software. Essentially, it turns your private cloud into infrastructure as a service. What you get is basically uh, an infrastructure as a service inside your company, inside your company, or you can offer it outside of your company. You can sell it. It also has this smart, very smart driver. Um, could you flip on the next slide? Um, it has this very smart driver that connects to Libvirt. So it sits between the access driver and the Libvirt interface. The Libvirt is uh, essentially, yeah, these are the front ends of Libvirt. Um, so essentially you have this open Nebula driver that gives access to the hypervisors. You can use Zen, KVM, there is a plugin for VMware, but also there is a pl plugin for EC2. Essentially what you can do is move your loads between KVM and EC2 seamlessly. The, the person that uses it doesn't need, to, doesn't need to know that. You can use it and uh, you can abuse it also. Essentially what you, what you can do is um, you can run all the virtual instances that matter inside your private cloud and you can assign the, the ones that really don't matter, let's say development machines or testing machines, you can run them on the EC2 cloud. There is also the, a preliminary support for Rackspace cloud, but if someone else needs uh, support for Oracle or um, let's say HP Cloud, you're very welcome to write one. So, unfortunately, we run out of time. 
and uh, I don't know if there will allow a few questions. Anyway, if there are questions, we are happy to answer them. Even if, if we run out of time, you can find us around and ask, ask your question. You can ask your questions in Bulgarian or in English. It doesn't really matter. So maybe, do we have time for a couple of questions? A couple of questions? OK, yeah, we have time. So if somebody has a question, yeah. You can ask in Bulgarian or English, it doesn't really matter, you can use the microphone. Okay, in Bulgarian. As a person, the infrastructure as a service. It's probably something for full and church in SCAP. Okay, the way. As a person, the infrastructure as a service, we have a limitation of the road. If we need to plug the machine with a lot more capacity of hardware and resources on the post, we need to change our application. Yeah, that's right. И има такива решения. Има ни французи, които работят в подобно решение, но това е в общи линии решение, което е приложимо всъщност при те наречения Big Iron. Аз тук виждаме ни хора, които се занимават с мейнфреймове. Така че, може би те могат да отговорят повече на подобни въпроси, как IBM в общи линии реализира подобно нещо. Но съжалявам от насорс решение такова подобно, което да е fully functional и работещо на този етап няма в което да можеш да обединиш няколко хардверни ресурса в един общ, в който има shared просто space. Има такива решения, но не са мачуя. Не работят добре. Тук следва следния въпрос. Ако можем да направим такова нещо, що пък да не виртуализираме върху едно такова цяло нещо? Да съберем всичките машини на едно място, да ги направим една голяма и после да слайсваме тая голямата. Така че да, това е много хубав вариант. Съжаление, все още няма такова решение. Работи си, но всъщност не е толкова просто за да се направи. Проблема е, че всяка една инстанция в общи линии си има собствен kernel space, в който има собствен process space, в който трябва да шерваш някакви ресурси. Там отиваш на вариант някакъв shared memory, в който всеки memory се махва, трябва да знае къде се намира. Доста е сложно. Тя са много бързо отлична. Да, тази бързо отлична връзка също се нарича Infiniband. Тази отлична връзка се нарича Infiniband. Да, да, при всички положения са също бързо, аз знам пърти нужди какви са. Да, пак, говорим за опасно все пак. Още един въпрос и ни гонят, ако има. Не чух последната част. Колко мегабайт текст трябва да се напише да се кофюра такова нещо? Ами всъщност не е много. Начинът по който се кофюра LibVert е много простичек. Той е един XML, който го отваряш и въобще не го конфюраш. Една конфигурация, за съжаление, може да ви покажа в момента. Една конфигурация, защото просто решихме, че няма не стигне времето и то така се го казва. Една конфигурация на една инстанция в LibVert въобще не е нещо от порядъка на... Зависи от това, каква е инстанцията, но между 20 и 40 реда. Проблема всъщност не е с това, че изисква много писане, конфигурация на подобно нещо. Проблема е, че изисква много четене, а няма ресурси. В общи линии всичко, което сме направили до момента базирано на LibVert като клаудове, сме го постигнали единствено само, защото сме чели сорт. За съжаление, в Linux света е положението е малко особено, за разлика от BSD света, в който всичко е прекрасно документирано, в Linux света нещата са отвратително документирани. И се налага да четеш сорса, и се налага да четеш мейлинг листове в общини, и да се ориентираш по камитите в Git, за това точно какво се е случило и кое как работи. От такава гледна точка, всъщност тя идеята на тази презентация е точно така да ви дадем някаква прелиминарна информация. И, на съжаление, аз също време да да влезе малко по-надълбоко, но ако имате въпроси, елата намерете ни и ще шернем наши експириенс и нолиш с вас. Няма никакъв проблем. В крайна сметка ни идеята е, че това е Open Source и Open Community. Да? Този проблем също се решава с подобен начин, по който всъщност работи LXC. 
Проблема е да този проблем се решава с контрол групи. А те наречените си групи. Това, което може да направиш е в общини да кажеш, че една, една определена инстанция на хипервайзора а, може да издадиш определени ресурси и казваш, да използваш тези групите и казваш, тази инстанция не може да надвишава повече от а, а, еди колко си а, камита пръсте, към да речем, с КСМ-а, или пък, а, или пък а, може да и кажеш, тя не може да надвишава над еди колко си количеството процесор, което може да използва. Виртуалната машина ще вижда 100% юсич. Де факто, ако е, ако е матната едно към едно към хардуера на юсич, това означава, че а, нали, говорим се пак за, за големи нума машини, в които в общи линии нещата се месят много бързо. А, в общи линии това, което се случва е, че ако имаш 100% юсич на, на виртуалната машина и ако е матнат към, към хардуерен процесор в момента, ще имаш 100% на хардуерен процесор. Това, което може да направиш, е да използваш контрол групите и да кажеш, тази виртуална машина в момента ще използва а, не повече от 90% real CPU usage върху хардуера. И това, което всъщност казваш е, че по този начин си правиш контейнери, в които рънваш виртуалните машини. Нали, не контейнери по начин, в който са лексите, но в общи линии пак използваш тези, тази техника. Това, между другото, е много адванс начин за, за правене на нещата. Наистина, в смисъл, това е, това е top of the top по, по начин, по който всъщност работи този open source софтуер. Гонете ни вече. Съжаляваме, намерете ви после, които трябва.